Welcome, everyone, to our chapel chat. This is Saturday, April 4th. So, Father, if you could read the Gospel. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen what Jesus had done began to believe in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees convened the Sanhedrin and said, What are we going to do? This man is performing many signs. If we leave him alone, all will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our land and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing, nor do you consider that it is better for you to, that one man should die instead of the people, so that the whole nation may not perish. He did not say this on his own, but since he was high priest for that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not only for the nation, but also to gather into one the, the dispersed children of God, so that from, so from that day on they planned to kill him. So Jesus no longer walked about in public among the Jews, but he left for the region near the desert to a town called Ephraim, and there he remained with his disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before Passover to purify themselves. They looked for Jesus and said to one another, as they were in the temple area, What do you think, that he will come, that he will not come to the feast? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So this Gospel comes right after the raising of Lazarus. And it's pretty amazing the response of the Pharisees, that some, some folks go off and tell them what happened. And you'd think that maybe after experiencing or hearing about such an incredible miracle, this is arguably the most impressive miracle that Jesus performed, that finally they would believe. Mm -hmm. And yet they don't. And it just shows that really what's at stake is a, a con, a, an attitude of the heart. Right. And whether it's a small miracle that you're witnessing or this incredible raising of a dead man to life, that it makes no difference. Still, their hearts are completely closed off mm -hmm. and, they, and they want nothing of it. And in fact, now they decide they want to kill him. That's right. For some people, it's not about evidence for God. It's not about evidence for Jesus. Um, it's not about evidence. It's about the attitude of the heart. I mean, yeah. you could have someone raised from the dead right in front of you and having everyone testify. Yeah. And people will still not believe. It reminds me a little bit of the, the parable of the poor man, Lazarus. He mm. dies in the, the doorstep of the rich man. Oh, yeah. Eventually the mm. rich man goes, goes to hell basically and he's there and he's asking Father Abraham if he could go to his brothers and tell them. And, and the, the God in, in that parable says, they have the prophets, let them listen to them. And, and the rich man says, well, no, but maybe if you send someone from the dead, like hint, hint, send me, maybe they'll believe. But then God's response is, if they don't believe, the, the prophets, then neither will they be convinced if someone rises from the dead. Right. Same thing. It doesn't, it's that attitude of the heart. It doesn't matter how profound a miracle you witness. Mm -hmm. If your heart is closed off, it's just, you're not yeah. going to change. And there's evidence all around us of God and his saving love and in the scriptures and God's voice and prayer, but it's not going to convince someone who doesn't want to be convinced. Yeah. What's interesting to me is that, um, is the line of reasoning that is used um, here um, by the, the chief priests, the Pharisees. Um, what are we going to do? This man is performing many signs. If we leave him alone, all will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our land and our nation. Notice the dynamic of fear there. If we don't do something, our nation, our land is going to be completely destroyed by the Romans. It's this dynamic of fear. Yeah. If we don't stop him, or if, if, if everyone believes in him, this is going to happen. And the irony here is it's precisely in the rejection of Jesus that they lose their land and, uh, and their nation yeah. uh, at the at behest of the Romans themselves. And yep. The irony is, is that Jesus himself, because he was rejected, they, they lose all of this. And, and as I think about this today, if, if we believe him alone and, we, and all will believe in him, the Romans will come and take away both our land and our nation. It's like this dynamic of fear, if... If I really believe in Jesus, or if everyone follows Christianity, if everyone follows this, then this might happen. You know, I look, I look about, um, I look to the dynamic of the human art. If I really give Jesus everything, all these good things that I like are going to be taken away from me. 
Right. I'm not going to be successful. I'm not going to have my joy. I'm not going to have happiness. I'm not going to be at peace. I'm not going to be able to achieve this in my life because Jesus somehow is perceived as a threat to my well-being. And that's a kind of a, an unbelief in our hearts. Right. If, I, if I trusted him with everything, then this is going to slip through my hands. And it's prioritizing things in the wrong way because those are legitimate things to be caring about and to be thinking uh-huh. about. Just as it was legitimate for the Pharisees to be concerned about the future of their nation, and it was under Roman conquest. But none of that matters more than the salvation that Jesus offers. We're not just talking about the, the, the success of your nation or your, your social structure, whatever it is. We're talking about victory over sin yeah. and death itself. Right. And that matters more than any of those things. It's interesting. I've, I often tell people, um, and, and sometimes in personal conversations or preaching, that in the end, death destroys everything in this world. Mm-hmm. And the only way that we're able to keep anything is to submit all that to God who alone has conquered the world. So if we don't believe in Jesus, the very things that we're afraid he's going to take from us are going to be gone anyway. Right. Like we're, right. We're, we're losing everything anyway. The only way to save anything is to have faith in him. Yeah. And so it's like it's a very similar dynamic that we see happening today in people's hearts. I was also thinking about how Caiaphas, the high priest, sort of unwittingly utters this prophetic statement about Jesus. He says, It is better for you that one man should die instead of the people so that the whole nation may not perish. And he didn't fully understand what he was even saying, but it's so true that it is better that one man should die than that the whole of the human race may not perish in the clutches of sin. And so if if even Caiaphas, his high priest, was completely rejecting Jesus, somehow managed to utter a prophetic word, then that gives me hope that God could speak through me. Maybe God will <laughs> use me in ways that I didn't even anticipate or, or expect that, that I also could, could uh, exercise that prophetic ministry that we're all called to. That's right. And even our lives are, are supposed to be prophetic. I mean, here is that they're plotting evil, yeah. right? And they, they sinned by rejecting Jesus and he was killed, which is the most evil thing that has ever happened. And yet God brought such good out of it. I mean, look at... Look at what's possible, as you were saying, that not just speaking something uh, to be prophetic, but our, our sometimes our actions, our sins, the very brokenness that we have can be turned into such good through the redemption of God. And yeah. so like even our actions can be prophetic acts about how God says, you know, you've done that, but let me show you what I'm going to do to reverse that evil thing you did to be good. And that we have so much hope because God can do that. And I love how this reading, because this is coming right at the very, the, 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 the edge of Holy Week, right? The day mm-hmm. after this, be, we begin Holy Week. And it says, so from that day on, they plan to kill him. Mm. And then a few sentences later, we, it ends sort of awkwardly almost with this question. They looked for Jesus and said to one another as they were in the temple area, what do you think? That he will not come to the feast? It's like the reading is, is inviting us to enter into that meditation. Like, what is the Lord going to do? What, what grace does God have for me? in these days and this week to come. Is he, is he going to come in an unexpected way? Is he going to be here or there? Who knows? We'll that's, have to just wait great. and see. That's a good segue into Holy Week. Yeah. Who knows? What's going to happen? How's he going to come to us? It'll be a different Holy Week, that's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, let's end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise and bless you for your goodness, for your love for us, for sending us Jesus, even though he was so often rejected and misunderstood and despised. Lord, help us to be present to you in a very special way as we begin this holiest week of the year. May we make room in our hearts for you and all of the graces that you have for us. Truly, this is an unexpected and unprecedented time for all of us. But you know all things, you see all things, you know our hearts and you can work through these circumstances. So Lord, we surrender ourselves to you. May this be a blessed week and a a truly holy week for each one of us. We pray all of this in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.